Welcome to our online service at Spearfish United Methodist Church in Spearfish, South Dakota. We are glad that you are with us for our worship. We're going to be asking a difficult question in our worship service, and the question is, what is the opposite of spirituality? And we're looking at the Corinthian church, continuing on our series there, and looking at how their divisions and some of the things that are going on in their church question their own spirituality. And Paul does so as well. So I hope that our worship is uh, good for you tonight. We're glad that you've joined us. I'm Janelle Jones, Spearfish United Methodist Church. The Congregational Values Discernment Workshop will be held Saturday, February 25th at 8 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. What is most important to us as a church? You can help to clarify our values by participating in this workshop, which will be led by Reverend Connie Eichinger. It is important to have many participants and ages from teens through elders. Congregational Values Discernment Workshop, Saturday, February 25th, 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. in Fellowship Hall. Please register with the church office and indicate if child care is needed. Thank you. Our first scripture comes from Matthew 5, verses 21 through 37. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard what is said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. This is a prayer from a biblical scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann, and it's entitled Super Bowl Sunday. I'll invite you to join me in this prayer in just a little bit. O oh God, the world of fast money and loud talk and much hype is upon us. We praise huge men whose names will linger only briefly. We will eat and drink and gamble and laugh and cheer and boo and marvel and then yawn. We show up, most of us, for such a circus and such an indulgence. Loud clashing bodies, violence within rules, and money and merchandise and music. 
And you, today like every day, you govern and watch and summon. You are glad when there is joy in the earth, but you notice our liturgies of disregard and our litanies of selves made too big. Our fascination with machismo power and lust for bodies and for big bucks. And around you gather today, as every day, elsewhere uninvited, but noticed acutely by you, those disabled and gone feeble, those alone and failed, those uninvited and shamed. And you whose gift is more than super, overflowing, abundant, adequate, all-sufficient. The day of preoccupation with creature comforts writ large, we pause to be mindful of our creatureliness, our commonality with all that is small and vulnerable exposed, your creatures called to obedience and praise. And would you now join me? Give us some distance from the noise some reserve about the loud success of the day, that we may remember that our life consists not in things we consume, but in neighbors we embrace. Be our good neighbor, that we may practice your neighborly generosity all through our needy neighborhood. Amen. Our second scripture comes from 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 9. Brothers and sisters, I cannot address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, Are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul, only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task? I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose— and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. It's a difficult passage that I'm dealing with tonight. It's a Difficult passage both in the New Testament with the gospel, with Jesus saying we have to go beyond what the worldly laws are and move into kingdom laws. And then Paul talking about divisions in the church talks about those who are mature and those who are infants. We started this series uh, several weeks ago with uh, Paul seeing the Christian, the Corinthian church for what it is, but also for what it can become. And the key to all of that is God's continuing faithfulness to everyone in the church. In the second week, we talked about how there is to be unity in the church, that Paul's message for the Corinthians is the message for all of us, that the church needs to be one in mind, no divisions. And then goes on to talk about divisive alliances that are in the church at Corinth, that there are some who follow Paul, others who claim to follow Apollos, still others Cephas, and yet yet others (coughs) who claim to follow Christ. And there is jealousy and quarreling and divisions in the church. In the third week, we saw that there's only one division that really matters, and that one division is the division between those who are perishing and those who are being saved, and that the division, the dividing line, is the response to the cross, whether you see it as foolishness or as God's power to save. And then in week four, last week, we saw how Paul 
connects to the, Christian, to the Corinthian church. He says, I'm not coming as a wise, eloquent philosopher, but I'm coming as one of you. And he says that God's wisdom may be attained not via worldly wisdom, which is altogether a bunch of noise, but via the Holy Spirit. And the key is to slow down and to breathe. Tonight we look at how wisdom for the mature is separated from worldly infants. And this is a tough one. It was a tough message to prepare. It's going to be a tough message to hear. But as a transitional pastor, sometimes I have to do the tough stuff. So let's take a look at our passage tonight. We have to ask, what is going on here to start with? Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk not solid food, for you were not ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. So Paul's talking about adults, about infants, about milk, about solid food, about feeding people. And you wonder, is Paul calling the Corinthian church a bunch of big babies? One commentator said that the metaphors that are used here of solid food, of milk, of infants, of mature adults. The metaphors here are stock language in relation to philosophical and religious instruction throughout the ancient world. So it was something that the Corinthians were familiar with. The assumption is that spiritual progress can be graded and that a different sort of curriculum is appropriate to each level of maturity. Makes me think of middle school, where eighth graders reign as royalty and the rest are a bunch of trash. But it's not quite like that. But there's certainly a sense of superiority in the Corinthian church. And the Corinthians think that they're on the top of the heap. So what is Paul doing? Well, some Corinthians, we've already learned, look down their noses at, at Paul. These are upwardly mobile people who are stepping on others in order to ascend to the top. And they've moved, in their estimation, beyond the level where Paul is at. And so Paul is effectively going to be turning the tables on them, but in order to do so, he's going to need some evidence to present to them that they actually are the ones at the bottom of the heap and not at the top. He gives them two categories. The categories are spiritual and worldly. He says in the last chapter that he has wisdom for the mature, for those who are spiritual, and it is God's wisdom, which you remember because we've said it over and over, that God's wisdom is Christ crucified, which is foolishness to the world. And those who are able to accept this spiritually, because it's spiritually discerned, are the ones who are ready for solid food. Now the worldly, Paul refers to here as infants, that they are going to be needing milk. Notice he still feeds them, but he feeds them what is appropriate to them. He tells them that they are acting like mere humans. Take a look at here. You are still worldly. For there is, since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? Acting like mere humans? Fancy language like, are you not acting like everyone else? Not spiritual? And if we say that they're not acting spiritual, then we would say that they're acting in a rather secular manner. In other words, they're acting just like everyone else, as though Christ has made no difference in their lives. This is what he says to them. And the evidence that he brings to bear is jealousy and quarreling on their part. And again, we think of middle school with jealousies 
and quarreling and a bunch of big babies and the bullies and those who are bullied. Or maybe you think of groups in high school, like in my high school, we had the jocks, we had the burnouts, we had the nerds. You insert whatever name it was. You had probably the, the greasers, you know, all, the, all these different groups. But there's a different sense of what's going on here. It's not that these groups are jealous of one another. It's not that I wish I was in with the in crowd, like maybe the people who were following Paul, they wished they were in the Cephas group. That's not what's happening here. Jealousy, the word that's translated jealousy here, can also be translated as zeal. And that means that in each group, the folks are zealously preaching and defending their positions. And in doing so, whether consciously or unconsciously, whether verbally or whether just implying it, they are excluding others from their group. And they are seeing others as opponents instead of as fellow Christians. And then they go on to create characters, caricatures of their opponents. We're right, they're wrong. Quarreling might be seen as battles, taking sides, contesting with one another, fighting instead of working together, and then lobbing accusations at the other side, at their own brothers and sisters in Christ. This is what Paul is talking about when he says it makes them worldly. They're acting like mere humans. They're acting in a secular manner. They're acting like those outside the church, just like everyone else being divided into one group or another. This is going back to the divisions, as you see here. For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? Just like the outside world, not very spiritual, and Paul is thinking, this is not the type of church that I really wanted to plant here in Corinth. So there are two categories that I mentioned at the beginning, and the two categories were spiritual and worldly. And for Paul, as we see here, worldly means divided. So for Paul, we might say, and I think we can say, especially with the message of 1 Corinthians, that for Paul, the opposite of spiritual is divided. So when we divide, it's not because we're more spiritual, it's because we're mere infants. And if I say, if we say, well, well, they're the infants, then by saying they, we form a division and we mark that we are still infants. And I think we need to pause here for a moment and reflect on that, that the opposite of spiritual for Paul is divided. Think about our own denomination for a moment. We are divided and we're dividing. We're taking sides, we're picking favorites. We are divided and according to Paul, that means we're not very spiritual. But we've, all, we've always been divided as a church, one might say. I mean, look at history. There's been major splits in the church every 500 years, and there are so many denominations that you can't even count them. There was a great schism in 1,000 when the East split from the West. Huge churches that split off from one another. And then the Reformation happened, and you had the Protestant church and the Catholic church, and then the Protestant church became thousands and thousands and numerous denominations. 
And we might, we might answer, well, well, God must want a divided church. It must be a divided church because only one church is really following Christ, right? And Martin Luther, when he split away from the Catholic church, would have said, no, I don't want to split away from the Catholic church. And John Wesley, when he led the Methodists away from the Anglican church, had no desire to leave the Anglican church. The Apostle Paul had no desire that this church in Corinth split into different groups. So why do we put up with it? And we might answer, but but we're the ones in the right. And some would say, well, you're on the wrong side of Scripture. And others would say, well, you're on the wrong side of history. And others might say, well, I can't worship with those people. But when we split, it's not because we're spiritual. It's because we're still infants and we're still just like the world. And we need to sit with that for a week. Because I don't have the answer for you tonight out of of tonight's Scripture. Paul's initial response is to say, this is God's church. Paul and, or Apollos and I are God's servants. I was a planter, Apollos was a water boy, and God is the source of the growth. We aren't the focus here, Paul says. God is. We are working together in this, Paul says of he and Apollos. We are working together. We're not trying to divide anyone. Now there's more on this next week as we we conclude this series. But he finishes by saying this. He says, you are God's field. We are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field. Now if you take that, and take a field and make it into a garden, you could say that we are, as a church, we are God's garden. And if you think of God's garden, you think of the Garden of Eden. You think of the church as demonstrating love and unity to the world. But is that what people see in the church? And does the Apostle Paul have a point for us today? Let's think about that this week. I want to leave you there because Paul doesn't say easy stuff tonight. And Jesus didn't say easy stuff. Both of them said we have to be different from what the world is asking us to be so that we become attractive so that we become a beacon, a light on a hill, a hope for a people that is struggling. Amen.
if a job, health insurance, and the mortgage are all you have to worry about. Consider yourself lucky. When Jesus said, but I say to you, he was raising the bar, calling for more than the law requires. He was calling us to righteousness. Let us go from here determined to follow the call by the Spirit's grace and to live as disciples every moment of our lives. Go with God. Amen.